All right, I think we'd just go ahead and get started. So first off, thanks to everybody for joining in. As I mentioned, this is kind of the new reality of doing business, trying to connect to each other from our various home offices and locations around the world. We had hoped to all be in person today uh, with our UDACON conference, but of course that was overcome by events and uh, obviously had to postpone that. That is postponed, it is not canceled, so we'll be working with the hotel once things settle down to set a new date. We appreciate everybody's support and patience, but glad that, uh, that we canceled it early so folks could make alternative plans. Um, the session today is really meant to just be informal. We're hoping that you guys are gonna actively participate. So if you have <clears throat> questions, Bob will step through kind of how you can ask questions. If somebody has something that they'd like to say or speak to, we obviously can turn control over to them or bring them in from a video or audio conference perspective. But we wanted to just go through some of the content that we've been covering on the site, kind of our thoughts, and really have a good community discussion around uh, what we're doing and where we're going and how we can be most helpful to the community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bob for a few admin items. Great, and first I'd like to say, um, looking at the people who've signed up and registered for this, uh, we're all friends. So uh, forgive me if I get a little bit informal, uh, but it seems like we all know each other. And I also wanted to mention that I know everybody's familiar with Zoom, uh, but if you haven't seen this particular uh, setup of a webinar, I wanna remind you that you can ask questions and answers. We specifically uh, turned that function on. You can ask any questions. And then we also made it so you can see everybody else's questions and you can vote questions up or down if there's something you want to bring to our attention. So depending on what your platform is, you'll see the, the question bar at the top of your screen or the bottom of the screen. It's on the top of an iPad. It's on the bottom of most PCs. Uh, but just click on that question box. And if you want to submit a test question now, uh, go ahead. We're also monitoring the chat. I see a lot of people are, are already in there saying hello and uh, thanks for that. Um, so we'll be watching both the chat and the Q&A throughout this. Um, oh, and besides uh, being able to vote on other people's questions, you can comment on them. So we turn that feature on as well. Another thing I wanna do is, you know, as Matt mentioned, we were gonna gather in person and we um, set up a lot of fantastic speakers that we're still gonna be engaging with and bringing the speakers into this kind of platform and sponsors. And the sponsors are what really allowed us to make that future proof happen. And when we contacted our sponsors and said that uh, we're going to have to reschedule our Uticon, a hundred percent of them were strongly supportive. And we just really, really appreciate that. And I want to tell you who they are right now, because um, I'm just out of appreciation. Centripetal Networks, a lot of you already know Centripetal. Um, they're providing clean internet, essentially. Um, Accenture Security, and Accenture Security has built a fantastic capability over the last several years. Palantir, a commercial off-the-shelf solution, ready to go now for a foundational data platform. Uh, Volvix, a, you know, applying artificial intelligence and machine learning to cybersecurity needs for enterprises. Percipient, which is looking at, uh, is providing a platform of artificial intelligence and machine learning and video analytics and machine vision uh, to some of the hardest national security and law enforcement challenges uh, out there. Quintessence Labs, which is applying uh, quantum effects to build a, a very high entropy a key distribution system, key creation and distribution system, which is quantum proof. So um, Quintessence Labs is very high tech. Wicker, uh, many of you here know and love Wicker and use Wicker as a secure collaboration system and secure messaging system. Garrison has a very unique cybersecurity capability that will allow an enterprise to be totally connected to the internet, at least that's the way it looks from every user, but then uh, prevent the malicious capabilities from coming into your enterprise. That's Garrison. And Ativo Networks, um, we um, love for a lot of reasons. One, one of our good close allies and associates, uh, Tony Cole works there, uh, but also Ativo has a very unique capability for um, applying deception to enterprise security. And um, that's our sponsors, thanks. And I also want to mention, before diving into the first topic, we are talking a lot about COVID-19, a very serious topic. I just checked the very latest stats, kind of sombering. sombering. Uh, Italy's death toll is surpassing China already. Um, as far as we know, we don't know the accurate numbers from China, but uh, reported uh, Italy's deaths are now 3,405. 
um, China's were 3,245. By the end of the day today, another very somber statistic, we'll be passing globally uh, 10,000 deaths worldwide. So a very serious topic and one that we need to all of us um, pursue together. And uh, with that, I wanna um, introduce Matt's first topic. Um, and Matt, as he was writing about this, uh, the way I thought of it, he's writing about how do you outthink an enemy like this? Uh, you outthink an enemy that never stops, never sleeps, uh, never pauses, uh, cannot be influenced through uh, perception management or information operations, and will just never tire and never give up. So with that, Matt, how do you do that? Thanks, Bob. Uh, and I'm going to reiterate and encourage everybody to use the, uh, the Q&A. I see, see a few folks in the chat as well, uh, but by all means, put stuff in the Q&A form. This is really as much for you as it is for us. And just scrolling through the list of attendees, as Bob said, I mean, there's some incredibly bright people in here. We started covering from a kind of a unique content perspective um, the coronavirus stuff back in early February. I think this is something that was on both Bob and I's radar screen going back into late December, early January. We run that site, OODAloop.com, and we've brought together kind of a conglomerate of people that are in our OODA expert network, as well as folks that were going to attend the conference. And the main purpose of that site is to actually inform your decision cycle. And uh, last week, as we were getting ready to make you know, a crunch of very critical decisions at the government and business level, I pushed out this, this piece that resonated with the community that was around how you need to tighten your decision cycle around the coronavirus. This is a piece that, uh, looking at the site stats, was shared 450 times on social media, so it really resonated. And it was really meant just to drive leadership to say, in an age of imperfect information and when we don't have you know, everything that we need, how do you make more rapid decisions and how do you kind of err on the side of caution? Uh, it was easy to see some scenarios where you're going to have to be working from home. So how do you accelerate that process? And we're seeing just incredible transformation as a result of people making those decisions and executing really quick. A couple of stats, you know, I don't think, you know, officially, but Facebook got 45,000 people to work from home in a week, right? By making that rapid decision to say, okay, we're going to go to a work from home only workforce. And that's not including the 30,000 contingent workers that are also now doing the work from home. Uh, another colleague that commented that they went from a 1% work from home workforce to 100% for 20,000 employees. Again, a pretty drastic scale up that required folks to be making rapid decision making, as well as kind of the plea to engage in social distancing and to start closing some of these public venues, some of these schools, et cetera. And that was really around the fact that we saw these numbers emerging out of Italy. We could trend ourselves to being kind of 10 days behind we rarely have an opportunity to look into the future with any sort of degree of kind of statistical accuracy. And I think what we saw with, especially with the emergence of Italy and the overwhelming of the hospital systems, an opportunity to do just that. So that was what we kind of call time shifted intent from a decision making perspective. We could see what a potential outcome was. And if we didn't want that outcome to be ours, what are the decisions you could be making now that would actually uh, impact that or prevent it from happening? We use the time shifted intent for a lot of different adversarial perspectives and also forward looking from an opportunity perspective. So really the whole sole purpose of that piece, and I'll be curious to see you know, if anybody comments that it resonated with them or they used it to educate their management, was that we are in a period in which we have to make very rapid decisions and we need to make them with imperfect information. Cool. Just looking, Matt, I don't see any open questions from um, participants, but I have one. I'm just really interested. This did resonate with a lot of people. Um, and I'm wondering why it wasn't just that it was written about this hot topic. Uh, was it the mental models? Um, what was it that caused this to resonate with people? Yeah, I really feel like it was a period where uh, they were trying to get their leadership to engage in more rapid decision making. So the folks that, that emailed me and messaged me the most, you know, and, and I obviously didn't hear from all 450 that shared it online, uh, were really saying, hey, I use this to drive a decision at the executive level. I use this to show that there was an urgency. I used it to show that there, you know, that failure to make a decision, which is one of the things I highlighted in the post, is a decision in of itself when dealing with something like this. Um, 
So that was, you know, one of the key components was, hey, we need to make more rapid decisions here. If you have a decision that you are at the top of the chain and making, that you need to make it and kind of err on the side of caution. And I think that that caused a lot of organizations to kind of dig down and say, okay, that decision-making authority rests with me. Now I need to make a decision now. I don't need to wait two days for more data. When you start talking about flattening the curve, days matter. Uh, mass participation matters, right? So there were these, uh, it was kind of a forcing function around that. Great. Thanks. And guys, uh, keep asking questions throughout this and we will keep pausing and looking at these as we go. No questions now, Matt. Yep. All right. Well, with that, Bob, I think it's good to kind of transition to kind of some of the thinking we were seeing around this early on uh, with the post that you had on the February 7th. It was about uh, how it was going to impact the long mid-range and long-range business planning. Right. If everybody can think back to February 7, it was a different world back then. You know, it really was, you know, over a month. Uh, but there had been a paper written just um, uh, two weeks prior by uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, which kind of spelt out clearly what's going to happen and the fact that very strategic things need to occur. Um, meanwhile, a lot of corporations were already getting a feel that a lot of tactical actions have to happen. And the CDC was standing up their website. The World Health Organization was standing up their website. And there's a lot of tactical actions were occurring. And our thought was, all right, this is important. Stay focused on the tactical uh, preservation of life. But you know, preservation of way of life is also important. Uh, so corporations that want to endure and survive need to think strategically. And uh, if you haven't seen the post yet, please take a look. What we were trying to do is now give you a framework for thinking strategically um, for scenario-based planning, because who can know the future? Um, you can't with any certainty know exactly how this is going to turn out, but you can build reasonable scenarios that you can walk your executive team through to um, exercise different contingency plans. We uh, produced four scenarios. You can think of it as a two by two matrix um, based upon, you know, a scale of are there, you know, is it low financial impact to high financial impact? Is it um, low casualties to high casualties? And then each uh, quadrant of that uh, forms a different scenario. Um, and then the actions that drive your corporate planning will differ depending on which scenario occurs. We also listed in there the kind of questions that could be asked during executive tabletops or strategy sessions to uh, really drive that kind of scenario planning home. The post is still up and this is one that's open for all because we really wanted to get it out to, to everyone. Cool, kind of a key question and uh, thanks for the feedback on the microphone. I did back my gain off a little bit. So uh, Bob, let me know, not Bob, you, Bob Stratton, if that helps. Um, appreciate any feedback uh, around audio quality or video quality, et cetera. Uh, with regards to that post right now, Bob, kind of, you know, we were, that analysis came out from kind of an imperfect decision-making perspective. We talked about not having full range of data. Uh, what would you change about that report from over, you know, almost a month and a half ago, given what we know today? You know, I think the most important thing is I would underscore how important it is that organizations do their strategic planning it's important that we uh, drop a lot of things into tactical planning. I heard from one of our clients today that they're in a, a, a big uh, drill to get all of their employees back in CONUS. Uh, they're distributed worldwide and they just, they're trying to get everybody back before things just totally shut down. That kind of tactical drill um, overrides everything, but still you have to be in, in this tactical firefight, be thinking strategically. And I think I would have, underscored more in that article, the fact that somebody needs to be thinking strategically. Why? Because the whole economy is really going to be shut down and we're going to need to reboot it and reboot it fast. Um, and the faster these companies can reboot and start hiring again and getting the economy going, the better it's going to be for everyone. So I think the thing I would change in that would be um, you know, get somebody and focus them on the strategic issues uh, why you're doing all the tactical firefights. This might be a great time to pause so that we're not flooded, you know, with all the questions at the end. I see we have two that have come in. Cindy's asking, what permanent changes in business, strategic planning models, emergency response efforts should we expect to see in a post-COVID world? 
Wow, she's asking a good question. And Matt, I want your thoughts on this too. And I think we might want to keep this an open one and write more extensively about this. But one change I think we're already seeing is the stand up of cross functional teams for strategic planning uh, for this kind of issue. So uh, large corporations have many moving parts from production to distribution to uh, finance to human resources. Um, most of them reporting up to some central authority, a chief operating officer and a staff, um, and not enough of this cross-functional work. But meanwhile, adopting to this requires cross-functional teams to make the, the strategy really executionable, executable. And I think that's one enduring change we're going to see. But meanwhile, markets are changing. And we're going to talk a little about, about markets later. And that is going to drive some fundamental changes in how corporations go to work and supply chains is, supply chains are changing. Um, the whole um, globalization is changing and we're going to talk about that a little bit later too. So I'd suggest we keep that one an open question, although that was voted up by several folks. Um, we may want to write about that more frequently. Matt? Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. And I think the other aspect of it is, you know, a little bit more focus on scenario planning uh, I think a little bit more focus on long-term resiliency. I mean, we're seeing a lot of negative impacts in the markets based on uh, companies just not having the financial reserves to manage a contingency type event like this. Uh, and, you know, a lot of citizens asking very hard questions as to why, you know, if, if you as a citizen are asked to have three months in reserve from a cash flow perspective in case of any emergency, why aren't businesses planning for that or more? Uh, so there's going to be some very interesting questions around those aspects of it. Uh, I definitely think the kind of the work from home or what is required uh, in order to get work done, it's going to be a lot of great studies, I think, around productivity uh, coming out of this or how we're able to scale up the work from home, what worked, what didn't work, kind of some of those models, I think, will be very interesting to watch as well. Uh, another question that came up, uh, and then we'll go back to the content and you know, address the questions a little bit later as well. Um, while people's lives and health are more important than economic impacts, the reality is economic impacts also impacts people's health and lives. I'd appreciate hearing some of your thoughts on how you add this variable into your OODA loop. This is kind of, you know, for me personally, right, it's obviously hard to watch because I feel like at this point in time, there really is not any sort of safe haven, right? I mean, there's one-off stocks that have performed well because people are using Zoom more, or Peloton bikes are, you know, increasing in subscriptions. But in reality, you know, just it seems like every sector and segment of the economy is being impacted. Um, so this is one where, from a decision-making perspective, you know, I think we have to prioritize on the health and safety aspect of it. And those, you know, result in some very difficult decisions. Trying to figure out, again, what are the models for sustaining a business that relies on local patron support? I think we're also seeing a lot of interesting things emerge there. I'm sure your social media feeds are also flooded with tip jars and, you know, other ways in which you can support small businesses, but we're going to have to definitely think through some of those contingencies. Um, from a decision-making perspective, though, I think it is that, you know, as we, we've seen demonstrated by some of the business and government decision-making, the priority has to be on the health and human component and the understanding that the markets are you know, resilient and that over time that we should be thinking about this as something that we get through uh, and that we will recover from. So kind of ignore some of the short-term pain and the anxiety associated with that. And you see varying levels, right? It's very difficult to determine right now. I keep telling folks, take it in two week or one week block increments. Bill Gates did an excellent uh, ask me anything on reddit.com yesterday. And he was predicting that we're maybe in like a six to eight week window of disruption and then things start to, to recover. Um, so I would focus on the, the things that you can control, you know, trying not to have anxiety associated with the economic factors, looking at business models to try and support some of these businesses that are struggling, uh, but with the recognition that over the long term, you know, resiliency should win out. Right. And my only comment on that is I have seen, you know, many of the people here are friends and people I've, I've known for a long time. And um, a lot of you, like me, like to have fun and like to enjoy life. And um, you have families and you want them to have fun and enjoy life. And but the, meanwhile, it's a very stressful time. And a lot of us are the type A personalities who are just going to work all the time to try to make a difference. And it wears on you. It really does. And um, um, Bob Flores had just put a comment in here about the fact that, you know, this does uh, cause stress 
and uh, stress reduces the strength of your immune system. And there's analogies for the economy, but this is also directly about us humans. So yep. um, I think we'll sh we should probably jump back into the, the content and then circle back to these topics a yep. little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I will just say, you know, I had a chat about this with one of my best friends this morning where I said, you know, now is the time to be a little bit more stoic, right? Those things collapse, they can be rebuilt, you know, as markets go down, they can go back up. So deal with the reality that's kind of immediately in front of you that allows you to be as productive as possible. Right. The, uh, the next topic that we had on here uh, was basically the, the next piece of analysis that we put out around the coronavirus, which was rather than try and reinvent the wheel, right, for our members uh, around uh, some of the business analysis, being able to also point you to external resources. One of those external resources was the work that's been done over at McKinsey. Uh, and the link to that is within the blog post. And we'll send out an after, uh, com you know, after webinar email that includes links to all the stories we're talking about, or you can just hit oogaloop.com and see them as well. Um, they've been producing some excellent analysis with regards to the impact on particular sectors of the economy, contingencies, potential scenarios, right? So we were highlighting that for some of our folks. We have invited the woman that uh, leads that practice to join us for a future webinar. As you can imagine, she's a little swamped right now, but that's something we're hoping to bring to the audience uh, if you feel like that would be of value. We also talked with, uh, with Dr. Peter Katona, who's got 30 years of dealing with things like the coronavirus and the pandemic response type initiatives early on for some metrics to say, what are the things we should be tracking that are going to be the most impactful? Uh, and interestingly enough, he told us at the time, degree of contagiousness is one of the most important metrics, severity of illness, again, another very important metrics. And then another one that we don't see covered as widely, you know, but we are watching, which is spread to the Southern hemisphere. So those are kind of the three things, you know, if he had three items that he would tell our members to watch for, to determine the impact, uh, those were the, the three that fell into place. With regards to these resources, we decided uh, we're gonna stand up just a permanent page on the site. And as we identify resources like this that we think are very useful, we'll just add them to it. So it's things that we think are impactful enough to inform your decision-making process. Uh, but obviously we're not gonna list every news story, every article, we're just gonna list the things that we think provide the most value. So watch for us to stand that up on the site soon as well. Yeah, Matt, it'd be uh, really good if uh, our members and everybody watching here, you know sends their uh, input to us if there's anything they think should be posted on that site. Yeah, absolutely. If you have resources or, or things that you think would be good to add to that site or that have been helpful, uh, by all means. Again, the, the primary purpose here is how can we identify things that inform your decision-making cycle? Yeah. So opinions from experts, models, data sets, there's a lot of great things that are being produced right now that are giving us a, you know, a better, different lenses at which to look at this problem. And back to the McKinsey report, you know, Matt, one of the things I really liked about that is they uh, started to look sector by sector at what the impact of uh, the coronavirus would be. And I wanted to ask if you had any thoughts on that. Which sectors do you think are going to be hit the hardest and perhaps be hardest to restart? Yeah, and it, it's it's tough because I'm not an economist, right? but I think it's pretty clear just looking at transportation and hospitality, going to be very, very difficult. You know, how long can a property operate with no patrons um, before they just run out of cash? Um, same with the transportation sector. I think that's going to be broadly hit. The energy sector, I feel like, you know, and that's another thing that we covered on the site um, that we can just kind of highlight briefly here. A lot of the hit in the energy sector, we interpret as kind of deliberate economic warfare by the Russians, right? We feel like they are taking advantage of the circumstances around the globe and have this ability to be even more disruptive. Uh, and, you know, the Saudis kind of calling their bluff on that and saying, okay, you know, we'll ride this to the bottom, see how painful we can make it. So that sector has been hit very hard uh, as almost a kind of a strategic warfare type play to impact other players in the industry. Technology, you know, communications, I think obviously we're seeing that they weather this. Financial services, again, you know, welcome. There are people that I see that are on this call that are much more suited to provide input. So if anyone wants to raise their hand to provide some perspective, we're happy to bring you into the chat and offer your thoughts as well. Uh, all seem like they're, you know, recoverable spaces. It's the hospitality and transportation that seem like they're, you know, potential biggest impact. Okay, great. So that brings us to our most uh, recent 
piece of content or kind of most recent uh, long form piece of content. And that was Bob, your piece where you talked about the impact of coronavirus on your markets and business strategy. Right. And this again is with this theme of, you know, preservation of life is number one, but preservation of our way of life is also extremely important. We all love our liberty. Uh, we like this free enterprise system. We like being able to create we like the fact that people can have jobs. That way of life needs to endure. Um, and for that to endure, companies need to understand what's gonna happen to their markets and how their business strategy should shift. So this post was all about some very um, matter of fact analysis of the situation, um, and then some observations about its impact on business, leading to specific recommendations for your action plan for how to get better. Um, starting with some, I got a little, little bit of pushback some, from some friends on this uh, statement that in a pandemic is where the government is at its very highest power. And our liberty is going to be impacted. Um, it just is. I really believe that we're going to bounce back and our liberty will come back. But um, it's how fast it comes back is frankly up to how well we do planning. And this document was all about the actionable insights that we want people considering to help accelerate your business growth when the economy returns so you can accelerate your hiring, um, so you can accelerate more innovation and in creating, uh, so we can all get our liberty and prosperity back. I think there's going to be some interesting challenges, right, that we need to address as a society around how we enable technology to help us with these issues. And I see a lot of anxiety, at least in my local community, around uh, where you have a person who has a known infection, kind of what public places did they hit? Do you need to be worried? Uh, in some uh, overseas countries, the cell phones are providing that data, and they're able to provide that kind of real-time report of over the past 24, 48, 72 hours, here are the spots. They went to this grocery store, they went to this movie theater, so that you can at least start to let folks know that they could possibly be exposed. So I think there's gonna be some interesting questions that come up around you know, technology enablement and whether we want that technology to assist in addressing some of these issues or not. Uh, there's some great questions coming in as well too, so we'll continue to get to those as we go along. The, the next piece that kind of relates to that is, you know, I provided some quick input for the local government folks uh, that are members of the community around uh, major uh, city emergency response plans. I worked uh, a decade ago with the 56 largest cities in the United States. So I have a lot of great connectivity into that community and the emergency planners there. And I had the mayor's staff, their head of for Homeland Security and Emergency Response, reach out and ask me, hey, what, what would you tell us to look at that we're not looking at? Provided some of those perspectives, but really what I was trying to drill at in the discussions with them was the fact that they need to be making decisions at the local level and they need to be building contingencies now. Uh, I have a sticker that I have on my laptop that says, no one is coming to save us, it's up to us. And that was kind of the message that I was trying to portray into those local governments. Don't wait for the federal government to act, act now. If you need to identify the Rolodex of recently retired doctors, if you need to identify the facilities where you can um, have surge hospital capacity, if you need to identify military assets, it might be able to assist you downstream that the governor can activate, that those are all things that you should be looking at now, but that you should take action at the local level. And I really think that's what we're seeing that is driving a lot of the significant response here, the shelter in place, the quarantines, a lot of that is happening at the local level. Uh, so those decisions are being made there. And that transitions us over to uh, Bob. You had this piece that basically was, what are the geopolitical questions to drive your strategic planning? Right. Another you know, key thing that this virus is changing is international relations. Um, how will it change international relations and the geopolitical situation uh, that remains to be determined, but we can start listing, listing the scenarios we think may occur and the questions that uh, we need to ask, and we do just that in this report. We go topic by topic. For example, si how will cyber conflict change? What new target sets will uh, Russians, uh, Ru the Russia's highest end uh, attackers want to attack, or China or DPRK? Um, what new target sets will criminals want to attack? We go topic by topic. Other topics, counterintelligence. How will our counterintelligence need to shift? 
um, intelligence. How will gaps in our intelligence um, um, appear and how will we address these gaps now because of the COVID virus? And then other big geopolitical questions. Will the EU continue to exist as a single entity or will it uh, dissolve and fragment into nation states again? Uh, right now, uh, borders are going up and uh, lots of turmoil in the EU and some are saying it's going away forever. Or will it come back as soon as the virus uh, recedes? These are questions we need to ask uh, so we can collect the right information, so we can you know, drive the right strategy in corporate America and of course uh, for the government as well. So please, if you haven't already looked at that report, dive into it, look at the topics, look at the questions we're asking, use it for your own food for thought now, and let us know what you think and if we are asking the right questions here. Great. So then just uh, was scrolling through the questions, lots of great ones rolling through. Um, Bob, Bob raised a couple, right, that I think from a, from a planning perspective, things we think need to be getting ahead of now is the emerging threat component of this. We talked about the Russians potentially waging economic warfare. Uh, we need to be watching for the cyber component of it, the misinformation component. There's lots of news outlets that are reporting and a lot of entities covering around some of those misinformation campaigns that are taking place. But then also, is there a parallel cyber type of activity that takes place that impacts our ability to respond appropriately to the crisis that we're facing? Back when we were doing cyber terrorism planning um, in the mid 90s into the 2000s, one of the things that we identified was the you know, most likely avenue for a real substantial cyber attack against critical infrastructure was somebody trying to increase or augment the impact of a physical attack. Well, we could now view the coronavirus as kind of the equivalent from a public risk perspective of a physical attack. And does somebody engage in cyber attacks to try and augment or en enhance the impact of that? All questions that we should be asking. Matt Blaze on Twitter has been asking some great questions around what does this mean for election security? You know, depending on the time frame, if the election ends up needing to be delayed or we need to move to alternative mechanisms, what are the impacts? And part of the key thing that we're trying to get organizations to address with a lot of the content that we're putting out is that shift forward in time around a potential outcome and then coming back to where we are right now, what actions do we need to enable and able to plan for that contingency or that opportunity or whatever it may be. Um, so with that, Bob, I think we'll scroll into the questions. We got some that are officially in the Q&A panel. There's a couple that popped up in the chat, so I'll address those first, and then we can move over to the Q&A. And again, okay. if somebody would like to uh, chat with the crowd around these topics, and we saw a request for talking about a product, we don't want to entertain product discussions, but if somebody has some expertise they want to contribute. Um, so there's a question coming in from Paul that says, do you have thoughts around the Chinese reports of no new local infections? How much can this be believed? And if so, does this provide any indicators for what to expect on the curve for the rest of the world? Uh, I don't think that's a number that we should be putting a lot of credence into, you know, with regards to is the testing matching or is there something that's not, you know, being appropriately disclosed? The Chinese government demonstrated very early on some pretty strict information controls around uh, the coronavirus and its implications. We saw the great report that came out of Citizens Lab up in Canada talking about the filters that were being put into Chinese social media prior to the government announcing that there was a crisis. They obviously knew and tried to control the information out the gate. But, you know, that said, I think it does show that, you know, there is the potential to do this curve flattening. There's a potential through the isolation, quarantine, et cetera, to manage this problem. So I think it's, it's a positive, but I don't put credence into the fact that they're down to a zero at this point. Uh, I, would, I would view that with a little bit of skepticism. Bob, any thoughts? No, I, I think that's well put. Well, all right, so bouncing over to the uh, open questions, see one from, uh, from Christina, from Chris Ward, about social transformation and the empowerment of introverts in a social distancing business world. Hey. Bob, any thoughts? No, I think uh, it's a very interesting observation. I never would have thought of this, and it's interesting that she put it that way, that um, the empowerment of introverts 
extroverts do have a bit of an advantage, or even for introverts like me that force ourselves to be an extrovert for a period of time. Um, now, what's this going to do for the introverts, the thinkers, the math whizzes, and uh, the, the creators? Will it really empower them? This is a good question. And it's another one that we may need to you know, think about. Will it be for good? It could be. You know, maybe there's a new cures created or you know, new business models created or new innovation. You know, will there be 10,000 more Bill Gates's bloom because of the empowering of introverts in new ways? It's an interesting hypothetical. Well, all right, kind of just uh, scrolling through these here. Uh, recently, some news outlets have reported on documents obtained via FOA that HHS guidance to IC professionals suggesting they lay up to three months of food in a pandemic situation. The worst category five was assigned to the pandemics with a 2% mortality rate. Do you have any perspective about the delta between that guidance and the general guidance of the public we've seen so far? Um, I think you, you're seeing a, a lot of uh, folks indicate that there's maybe a three month window or longer. We just talked about Bill Gates talking about the six to eight weeks as a potential best case scenario. Uh, so I don't think there's a, a huge discrepancy, but I think you're seeing right now is kind of a, a day by day, week by week view uh, of how we deal with this and what the impact is and collecting more data. I mean, one of the key issues that we've had has been the lack of testing in the United States. So not being able to realize how big of a potential crisis that we're facing, right? We have some pretty solid numbers around the number of percentage of, of patients that require hospitalization. Uh, so the more testing that we get, the better we understand kind of whether social distancing is working, uh, how much more is needed, whether we need some federally mandated uh, beyond what we've already seen. But I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that we could be dealing with this for at least the next three months. Right. And I would just add that, you know, I read as much as I can, and I swear if I knew an answer, I would tell you, uh, uh, maybe it's best to err on the side of caution and have enough supplies that could last, but supplies of stuff that you would eat anyway. Canned goods, for example, uh, canned goods, if you buy the right ones, check the date, the last several years. So stock up on canned goods, and um, if you need them for three months, you've got them. And if this is all over with in six weeks, you, you know, eat them over time. Um, so I'd say err on the caution and stock up is uh, there's other things you can do. Um, you can still buy on Amazon. I checked uh, the kind of uh, camping supplies, freeze dried food that will last you days. It's not the best tasting stuff, but it will, you, know, you can survive. Some people buy MREs. You can buy protein bars um, and, you know, just I err on the side of caution and stock up. And I think there's nothing wrong with being safe. And then at the end of this, if, if you are overprepared, you, uh, you eat what you've got and you haven't lost anything. Yeah. I think the other thing to point out, though, is that there's no indication that we're going to have any real drastic impact to the supply lines that are getting food and toilet paper and things like that to the American public. The shortages that we were seeing was based on contingency and kind of panic buying, right? So that's we see it even with a snowstorm in the Washington, D.C. area. We run out of bread, milk, and toilet paper. So I think what you saw was that kind of by a factor of 10, and then it also impacting some of these online supply chains because you had national demand. Uh, typically, when you see you know the snowstorm or other type of, of emergency, it tends to be localized, so it's hitting the local shelves. And what happened now is we you know was hitting us at the local level, but was also hitting us at the national retailers. That supply chain issue, though, is one that, that we've been tracking and will continue to track really closely. Um, you know, there's some stories in the press today about some of the Amazon warehouses being shut down, not because Amazon shut them down, but because the employees shut them down and kind of a, a safety strike, if you will, when they found that one of their coworkers had been infected with the coronavirus. Um, so I think that's something to keep an eye on. And as Bob said, you know, it's, it's not horrible to kind of err on the side of caution as it relates to that. Uh, this one's not a question, but just a, an FYI from, from Bob that the Virginia Department of Emergency Management private sector relations team has a survey open for Virginia businesses, both asking where companies are experiencing shortages as well as soliciting offers of assistance with products or services. They're also hosting a weekly private sector conference call Wednesdays at 1300. 
So good data for those that are in uh, operating businesses in the Virginia area. And we are seeing the impact, collecting stories every day uh, with regards to the local business impact here for some of those that are kind of consumer centric or require patrons in order to be successful. Question from- question here is interesting about, I think the liberty security dilemma. Uh, do you think this gives authoritarian countries a relative advantage in tightening their OODA loop to deal with the COVID-19 crisis or do they just face different challenges? It is interesting to me because this is like the old philosophical question in national security. Do you wanna be like Athens or do you wanna be like Sparta? Because Sparta is extremely well defended, but strict, no liberty. Athens, plenty of liberty, but not well defended. Um, right now, with this COVID-19, it seems like you have to be Sparta to defend yourself. But then there goes all your liberty. And that means it destroys our way of life. And that's not what we're here for. So I think the answer has to be, although there's some relative advantage of a, a dictatorship or a communist authoritarian regime being able to order stuff, um, we can't let that destroy our way of life. We have to have you know, top-down requirements you know, temporarily to restrict movement, but then you know, continue our way of life when this is over, even if they do have an advantage. Matt, do you have? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, they absolutely are, have an advantage, right? Because of the way they can control information and the way that they can enforce things in ways that we wouldn't tolerate within the US. I think the biggest thing is if you put on your, your planning hat or scenario planning and looking at potential impact, especially if I'm a company and looking at supply chain impact associated with international countries, um, you might use level of authoritarian regime as an ability, you know, to determine how well they're going to cope with this. Um, so I would just say from a scenario planning perspective, that gives us a useful metric and something that we can be tracking to kind of predict who is going to be impacted and kind of with what, uh, at what scale. And it might give you a little bit more granularity into the supply chains that might be impacted or how it might impact your international workforce. Uh, so those are definitely things that we should be tracking as we're trying to determine the, the business impact here. Couple other questions. One from uh, Colin Agee, uh, a good friend and a national security professional and an uh, intelligence professional. Uh, he makes a statement, China's definitely engaging in an IO campaign. I absolutely have to agree. And then questions flowing from that. Um, what's the impact on their domestic credibility, their standing internationally, their economy? These are great open questions. And I would say, first of all, you know, they are engaging in an IO campaign. Um, they are trying to shift blame away from their own horrible mistakes onto others, including us. Um, and they're coming up with fabrications that they're putting out in the media. What's the long-term impact? I think they lost a lot of credibility internally. Um, and it's, I'm not saying that it's really gonna cause a, the Communist Party of China to uh, lose all control, but they certainly lost a lot of credibility um, externally, all of their partners have seen this and the way it's happened, and it, it is hurting them internationally. And then the impact on supply chains and globalization, it's going to take some time to sort out. But a lot of folks are saying, look, our manufacturing capability has to come back here. Um, and maybe it's factories that are filled with uh, robotics and not a lot of employees, but we have to have the right amount of production here instead of relying on uh, countries controlled by a communist party like that. So there's gonna be major shifts and impacts that are hard for us to express in just a short, succinct webinar, but something is happening. And we're gonna to continue to track this and write about it in ways that lead to actionable uh, input to strategic planning. Yeah, I think uh, I would yeah, agree with what Bob said. I think you know the international standing component of this is 2BD. I think a lot of nations are too busy dealing with the crisis right now to spend a lot of time on kind of the attribution or the mismanagement or were there elements of this, you know, within China and failure to contain adequately disclose, engage the international community that contributed to the crisis that we're at. Uh, I think those are kind of the longer term TBD strategic issues. Um, domestically, I think, you know, the probably maintain credibility because they've been able to weather and from an economic perspective, I think over the short term, definitely an advantage given the fact that their supply chains and their economy is kind of the first to come back online uh, and is recovering quickly. 
I do feel like that supply chain is probably one of the biggest issues that we're going to be looking at coming out of this. Is nothing demonstrates supply chain dependencies, shortages, and kind of lack of strategic planning around supply chain fulfillment, uh, like a crisis like this that impacts you know multiple mul multiple countries all at once. Uh, so I, I do feel like there's going to be a lot of introspection coming out of here, looking at how we uh, rewigger some of our supply chain type issues. So there's a question here from Dan. Do you agree with Gates' suggestion that this is a six-weekish event before normalcy starts to return? I was given that stat that three-fifths of the workforce is hourly and or small business. I'm not aware of any previous recessions having this big and fast an impact in that segment, even if only for six weeks. Uh, do you think the government is capable of capable of protecting that big of a group. Again, this is a, a, something that is of unprecedented scale. I think the Gates six week, you know, time frame to, and it was pretty clear it was kind of a start to return to normalcy is probably accurate. It might be a longer term. You know, it's something I've been, I've been trying to mentally prepare for is how does this look if it's a much longer term type piece of it. Uh, and the government's ability to deal with that segment of the economy uh, that you mentioned that is impacted uh, is going to be stress test right now. I mean, we're seeing a ton of kind of creative and innovative thinking around getting people uh, checks to supplement their income. What's interesting here is I think you see some of the private sector entities stepping up uh, even before the government. I mean, it was fascinating to me that Facebook, by way of example, was one of the first to declare that kind of work from home and start to protect the workforce. They were the first to issue a thousand dollar bonus type stipend to employees based on disruption. They were the first to start a grant program to sustain the local businesses and the communities in which they have campuses. So I think what's also going to be very interesting here is not just the government uh, stepping up and how they're able to help that portion of the economy, but how some of these large private sector companies are able to step in and play a role. I mean, obviously, these businesses service and impact their employee population. They don't want to see them go out of business. I think we're going to see just some very creative ideas and, and execution and implementation of those ideas with, you know, the success factor, I think, is a TBD at this point. Right. Man, I wanted to mention something um, just as a follow-on to that. We've all, I mean, I want to say, looking over the list of the people here, again, you're all very successful people, um, which means all of you, all of that I've met, you have a bit of an optimist in you. You're all optimists. Um, I am. I certainly look for the bright things. And sometimes I go out and look for optimistic data in a crisis situation like this because I want to stay upbeat. And there are points of um, brightness and hope out there. Um, one, demographically, here in the U.S., we are a very dispersed population. Except for a few major cities where millions gather, uh, we're more dispersed than other. We're less dense. And I think it may mean that it's going to be easier for us to lock things down and get through this quicker. Another is uh, we've bought a little bit of time and there's far more research into drugs and uh, potentially life-saving medications that are already being used for other things like cholera that could be you know, rapidly applied to this fight. Um, quickly. It may be that a vaccine doesn't come for 18 months, but there could be uh, drug treatments that can come. So um, hope and look for this black swan event that's a, a good positive thing that disrupts this and makes it better. But as you all know, uh, hope is not a strategy. You got to plan for the worst. Uh, be ready to hunker down and protect yourself and your family, your employees, your company, and then when things get better to accelerate your company and back to growing in the marketplace. Just some thoughts on that. Excellent. So we'll keep the question line open and again, uh, offer up if there is somebody on the line that would like to provide some commentary, we definitely would welcome their perspective. So uh, let us know, Bob can promote you to be an active participant, either audio or video, uh, if you don't have your video enabled. Um, by way of kind of the future from us, we would love your input. Uh, and I see other questions coming in. We'll get that in a second. We would love your input as to how best to serve that uh, OODA loop expert you know, network community. Uh, we really appreciate everybody's support and being subscribers to the site. 
uh, we recognize, you know, in an age of so much content online that having a paywall there, asking people to pay is a big ask, but we do feel like we've differentiated what we've been doing to focus on that decision-making component. Uh, we were very frustrated by, you know, some of the media coverage needing to be sensationalist and not just around this topic, but around other topics or some of the, the, the other private sector content being kind of pay to play. So we were looking for that forum where we could bring experts into the equation, where we could network people together and we could provide that kind of uh, subject matter expert perspective that would inform the decision making process. Uh, so we welcome your feedback. You know, what would you like us to be covering on uh, on the site, on this topic, on other topics? We are, you know, we have this Zoom account that has the ability to hold a lot of attendees. As we start to go through the planning process for continuing the conference, we will also be hosting some of our speakers. So watch for us to be announcing events where we'll be bringing some of our key speakers into this platform to kind of engage and chat with the community as we move towards being able to meet uh, in person as well. Uh, or if there are other folks that you would uh, like to bring into the equation, by all means, let us know. Uh, or other ways which we can use this platform. Uh, for example, we're using it to host a cybersecurity happy hour on Friday afternoon, right? We're happy to turn on our Zoom account for as many attendees as, as, it, as it's reasonably possible to have in a video chat, just to engage in that collaboration and sharing of ideas and discussion as well. So Bob, while I was talking, it looks like we had another question that came in as well. Yes, from Kurt. Kurt is asking about, um, will certain countries be willing to overlook the effects of COVID-19 in order to take advantage of other nations' plight uh, for kinetic operations? And he gives an example of one conflict area in eastern Ukraine, uh, but there's a lot of hot spots that are being tracked. And, um, you know, the... Uh, 2019 intelligence community worldwide assessment, the one that every year in spring is briefed to Congress, addressed this very topic, a very prescient of them. They've been reporting on this every year. They include a map of hot spots um, where a pandemic could flare tensions. And frankly, there's a lot of places around the globe where this kind of thing could occur. You get a pandemic affecting a populace, the populace becomes um, uh, even more disgruntled and, uh, and, and causes um, conflict, which could spill over into nation versus nation content. So it's, the intelligence community, community certainly thinks this is a very real, very plausible scenario. At least they did in their assessment a year ago. I can only imagine that they think even more so today. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I echo that. I think we talked about economic, right? People taking advantage of it for kind of economic warfare disruption. We talked about it from a cyber operations perspective again, also either happening or likely to happen. And I definitely think there are entities that will take advantage of this from a sphere of influence, kind of geopolitical kinetic perspective as well. And that's something that we need to be keeping an eye on. It looks like that's it for the questions. And I don't see people uh, raising hands yet. Uh, if you have anything to say to the group, if you do, you'll see a, um, a button you can click. It says raise hand on your Zoom or just enter something into chat or in the, the Q&A and we'll get to you. We can randomly start selecting people, you know, give them the uh, pajama test to see who's joined from their pajamas or who actually <laughs> get up and get dressed. I went with the uh, Al Roker strategy, which is defined as a business dress shirt on top and Lululemon pants on the bottom. So maximum comfort. Maybe it's a good time before we really wrap up to mention again, you know, thanks for the sponsors of Future Proof. We are delaying the event of getting everybody together in our Udicon. Um, and when we do, you know, you'll see more about these sponsors and their logos. It's a, uh, you know, Accenture Security, Centripetal Networks, Palantir, um, uh, Volvix, Wicker, Quintessence Lab, Precipient, Garrison, a, a great company, um, Atibo Networks. And these guys really help us bring the collective together. Excellent. Hey, um, there's a couple, a couple of things coming in as we, as we chat. Um, the other thing I would highlight is, you know, for the folks on the OODA Loop site, we are running those expert interviews. First, I would encourage you go through as you're looking for new content and, and peruse who some of the other members are uh, on the site. And there's some incredible stories there 
Chris Ward does a great job at capturing not only kind of career trajectory, but getting their thought about what some of the strategic risks and opportunities are that exist out there, uh, as well as book recommendations. As you all know, I'm a huge reader, so I'm always uh, look forward to those book recommendations. I call it it's kind of the intellectual equivalent of a what's in your bag. Uh, you know, in the gear enthusiast, they'll always go and ask a technologist, okay, what gear are you carrying? Well, this is asking kind of what's in people's heads. Uh, if you would like to volunteer to be interviewed for that, by all means, uh, send us a note. We'll put you on the list. But just it's one of those things. It's a kind of great wealth of resources. Gives you an idea as to who's participating in these events and on these calls. Uh, and let's see. Looks like there's a couple of the things that came in. A couple of comments. So uh, is it being recorded? Yes, Jackie, it's being recorded. Uh, we'll be making the recording available as soon as Zoom is able to process it. We have noticed that uh, in our tests over the past couple of days that the cloud servers uh, are crunching a little bit under the load of decoding the video from these sessions, but we're hoping that we'll have it available to you in the next uh, you know, 24 to 48 hours in the worst case scenario. You know, this reminds me, Matt, I went through our sponsors so fast I uh, left out Risk IQ. I can't believe you let me do that. That's all. I'm you know, blaming you for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Risk IQ. I don't know if, if everybody here knows them or not. I certainly do. If you're in the cybersecurity world, you know Risk IQ. Um, uh, what they do is um, one way to look at them is they are your SIM tool for the entire internet. They look at all of the infrastructure of the entire internet. So they know how the adversaries are using the internet. And then they make that actionable for your decisions, including, you know, take down some piece of adversary uh, infrastructure or tailor your defenses to be able to thwart them or, you know, mitigate third party risk stuff that's not even in your own company because uh, risk IQ told you that something else is happening. So um, uh, more on risk IQ. Later. Yeah. And we'll include, they, re they released a great resource today that was uh, basically indicators of folks that are exploiting COVID and coronavirus for spear phishing and setting up infrastructure to take advantage of folks. So I pushed that out over my LinkedIn feed, but we'll be sure to include that when we put together our, our resource page on oodaloop.com. Uh, there's some, some great uh, content there and it's being updated dynamically. So if you want to be filtering within your organization, especially with everybody working from home and maybe the level of controls not being in place as consistently as they would if you were in the office or people connecting with alternative devices, they've, they've uh, conducted you know, a list of technical indicators that are showing you know, what domains are being registered, how they're being used, kind of how these spear phishing campaigns are playing out. Uh, so I'd highly encourage people to check that out as well. And that's one nice thing that is, we've seen from the community in general is just the the sharing of information, the making available of resources, you know, with uh, companies like Zoom opening up and allowing for folks to join uh, and engage in conference calls and Microsoft Teams and companies like RiskIQ and others, uh, all trying to be part of the solution. This is going to be, as we mentioned, one of the great lessons learned of rapid adaptation of the workforce. I and mean, I have been amazed at some of the some of the miracles that people have been able to pull off with regards to getting employees online. And we're going to see it across other elements as well. My daughter at UVA held her first online class today. I know some classes have already started, but we're going to see all sorts of uh, great innovation around work from home, how to secure the workforce uh, and how we engage in remote learning, remote education, remote socialization. So it's going to be, it's scary, but also interesting and innovative times as well. Cool. All right. I think with that, you know, we had reserved an hour and a half, but that was just so that the Zoom session wouldn't time out uh, right in the midst of questions. We really appreciate everybody joining. Hopefully that this was useful. Watch for the recording uh, so that you can share it with others in your organization. And please, you know, provide that feedback to us when you're perusing that list of experts. If there's one you would like us to do a webinar with or someone off the agenda from Future Proof that you would like to hear from sooner rather than later, let us know. We'll make that happen. Um, we're happy to arrange these as kind of, you know, rapidly recurring series of webinars. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.